Welcome to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio, sponsored by EarthX, the world's largest environmental experience, and also sponsored by Natural Awakenings Magazine. Live your healthiest life on a healthier planet. Now, here's your host, Bernice Butler. Welcome to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio today. We are now in our second season, and we're excited to continue to help you explore and understand the unbreakable relationship between your health and the health of the planet. We look at the hottest topics related to our environment and its sustainability and how they affect your health and wellness. Here, issues like climate change, plastic pollution, extreme weather events, and others will meet up with everyday impacts like allergies and asthma, digested issues and gut health, cancers, lung and heart issues, and more. So listen in today as we interview experts for today's show on global warming and climate change, the economics of climate change. Now, the fourth national climate assessment that was published in 2018 warned that if we don't curb greenhouse gas emissions and start to adapt, that climate change could seriously disrupt the U.S. economy. Warmer temperatures will set in motion some very significant occurrences that will damage property and critical infrastructure, as well as impact human health and productivity, and negatively affect many of our economic sectors, all the way from agriculture to tourism. As well, there will be damage to other countries around the globe, and that will also affect U.S. business through disruption in our trade and supply chains. In fact, we're already seeing, and right now today, experiencing some of the economic impacts of the changing climate. According to Morgan Stanley, climate disasters have cost North America $415 billion in the last three years, much of that due to wildfires and hurricanes. As well, scientific advances also give us more detailed information to let us know which assets and which operations are in harm's way due to climate change. For example, they let us determine just how many buildings will be inundated due to sea level rise. But the indirect economic impacts may be felt long before the actual disaster, such as impacts on risk perception as well as social systems. Now, this is a lot to unpack today, but we're going to try. And we have three very smart people with lots of expertise to help us understand some of this better. And we want to start off today with our economist. That is Professor Rob Williams. Rob has expertise in environmental economics, and he studies both environmental policy and tax policy with particular focus on interactions between the two. In addition to his role as a professor at the University of Maryland, he is the chief economist for the Climate Leadership Council. He is a university fellow at Resources for the Future and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Rob was previously an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, which is my alma mater, and a visiting research scholar at Stanford Institute for Economic Policy and Research. Rob has also served as a co-editor of both the Journal of Public Economics and the Journal of Environmental Economics and Management. He has a PhD from Stanford and undergraduate degree in economics as well from Harvard. Welcome, Rob. We're so glad to have you. We're so glad you could join us today. Thanks for having me, Bernice. Your expertise is the intersection of environmental policy and tax policy. So can you talk to us a little bit about that intersection and what it means to folks in our everyday lives and why we should care about this? Sure. The U.S. runs a lot of our policy through the tax system. We have tax deductions and tax credits for things that the government wants to reward or encourage, and that's across a whole broad range of things. But energy and environmental policy is is a big part of that. So there are tax credits for building wind and solar, tax credits for buying electric cars, et cetera. So if you're somebody who, you know, go go out and buy an electric car or a plug-in hybrid, you get up to a $7,500 tax credit for that. That's a big incentive to to be doing that. 
that's obviously relevant for the people who get those credits and deductions, but it affects everyone else too. That to the extent that, that they're doing that, that leads to less pollution. It helps encourage technological development, but it also has a cost that that revenue has got to be made up some other way. Um, higher taxes, more government debt, something like that, which, which puts some burden on the rest of us. Um, the biggest connection, though, even going beyond that, is something that we don't really have yet, but that is a, a sort of a promising policy direction we should go, um, which is uh, thinking about a carbon tax um, or more, you know, environmental taxes more generally. Um, we need to cut greenhouse gas emissions, and a carbon tax is the most cost-effective way to do that. So that's sort of the, the real natural intersection there is that policy. Um, a carbon tax would be a tax on fossil fuels, um, so oil, coal, natural gas, based on how much carbon dioxide those fuels emit when they're burned. And that wouldn't be charged to consumers, but it would be done upstream at the company level. It's a whole lot easier to do it that way than try and bill each individual person. And the basic idea there is nobody likes paying taxes, that taxing something discourages people from doing it because you want to do less of it so you pay less tax. For most of the taxes that we have in our system, that's an undesirable side effect. You know, we, we're, the point of the income tax isn't to discourage people from earning income. It's we need the revenue. The point of a sales tax isn't to discourage people from buying stuff. Sort of that undesirable side effect. For an environmental tax, like carbon tax, discouraging it is the goal. You know, that, that's the policy. Um, so, and it's a very cost-effective way of doing that. So, and there's widespread agreement that, uh, especially among economists, that a price on carbon, such as a carbon tax, is, is a central element of a climate policy. I, I was going to say climate change is going to affect everyone. Um, it, we're going to have damage from it. Um, but if we can do something about it, we can greatly limit that damage. We hear a lot about carbon tax. You hear that phrase thrown around. And I'm yep. glad you explained it because I sense that a lot of people don't really understand it. And I think during the election season, it's been thrown around like a curse word. I wonder if there's any such animal or any such activity wherein we can show people, here's the carbon tax, and this amount of carbon tax is saving you or helping you by this amount in terms of health cost or in terms of other economic cost that they can understand. Yep. So the, 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 the way that economists think about how you ideally ought to set a tax like this is you want to set the tax in a way that balances the damage against the cost of avoiding that damage. The best estimates we have are that um, another ton of carbon into the atmosphere uh, would do about $50 worth of damage. And there are a whole bunch of problems with that estimate and a whole bunch of limitations, and it's a difficult problem, but that's sort of the best estimate we have at this point. So uh, the standard economic rationale there, you know, when you burn fossil fuels, you're causing harm to the environment, you're causing harm to other people, um, and you're not paying the cost of that. Putting the tax in place gets you to pay that cost. Gasoline is sort of the easiest way you can, you can sort of um, link that to people's daily lives. One of the misconceptions out there is that the purpose of a carbon tax is to raise revenue for environmental policy. The, the way economists see it, the carbon tax is the environmental policy. It's doing the discouraging the carbon. And therefore, you can take the revenue and do something else with it. So the group that I've been working with, the Climate Leadership Council, has what they call a carbon dividend plan, where basically we tax the companies that are emitting the carbon and then return the revenue to households and estimate that that could get a $500 check to every person in the United States. That's $2,000 a year. I think that's the way to do it. Because, you know, that's the premise of our whole show, Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio, is to sensitize people to the fact of how environmental issues are affecting their health. And so you just said something that was music to my ears as you talked about giving it back, because we believe that something like that can then drive the change. But I want to talk about numbers. How has climate change impacted our economy in terms of cost to the gross national product, in terms of cost in lives and health cost? GDP misses a lot of it. Yeah. Um, that there are things like damages to agricultural productivity that show up in GDP. 
Other things, you know, if hurricane damages buildings, that doesn't reduce GDP. And in fact, repairing the buildings counts in GDP. If you think about just what people value, so people don't like having their homes damaged, um, you know, it, to the extent that their deaths caused. And we're probably talking currently hundreds of billions of dollars a year uh, in damage in the United States, maybe even into the trillions. Um, bad storms, hotter heat waves, more drought, sea level rise. All of it becomes more likely with climate change, but we can't nail down a particular one. So it's going to get worse. We've been with Dr. Rob Williams, and we will be right back for him to make us smarter on the other side of the break. Thank you, Rob. We'll be right back. And we want to give a shout out to our sponsors. That is EarthX, the world's largest environmental experience, promoting environmental awareness through expo, conferences, film festival, interactive experiences, and now EarthX streaming TV. For EarthX, Earth Day is every day. So join the movement, keep in touch, and add to the conversation at earthx.org. Our other sponsor is North Haven Gardens, the leading horticultural organization in Dallas since 1951, as well as Natural Awakenings Dallas Fort Worth Magazine, the Green, Healthy, and Sustainable Living Authority for the DFW Metroplex and North Texas communities. Print issues of Natural Awakenings can be found in all Whole Foods, Natural Grocers, Central Markets, Sunflower Shops, and online, free for download at nadallas.com. Check them out and find out about the Frisco Green and Healthy Living pages coming soon. Thank you, sponsors. Welcome back to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio. And we're back with Professor Rob Williams from the University of Maryland. He is an economist and helping us unpack some of the economics of climate change. Again, thank you for being with us, Rob. I want to delve a little bit more into the various countries and populations. Are there particular countries or populations that are hit harder by the impact of climate change on the economies? How much so and why would that be? Yeah, there are. The, I mean, it's going to affect the entire world. It's a global problem. And all over the world, you're going to be changing the climate. But there are places that are more vulnerable than others. So places where people spend more time outside, obviously the, the climate change matters more. Poorer countries where they have less ability to adapt, less air conditioning, stuff like that. Um, places that are more dependent on agriculture, that, you know, that, that's one of the industries that's going to be most, most damaged um, by climate change. Um, places that are really close to sea level, that the sea level rise from climate change, if you're a country where your big cities are all right on the coast, just a couple feet above sea level, that's a big deal. Um, warmer places. Uh, so that, you know, it, it, there are places in the world where being a little bit warmer, you'd think might actually make them a nicer place to live. But there are also places where being warmer becomes a big problem. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking sort of a, a, a place that would be a real disaster, like a place like Bangladesh, where they're already vulnerable to flooding, it's a poor country, it's hot sort of has a lot of these. But there are, there are even some surprises on this. So in Alaska, you would figure like Alaska is a place where getting warmer would make it better. But Alaska is actually of the U.S. states. It's one of the places that's seeing the biggest negative impacts right now. And that's partly because the dynamics of climate change have bigger effects near the poles. So Alaska sees a bigger change. But also they're having things like uh, permafrost melting. And so there are places where people's houses are shifting because the ground underneath them is thawing. Um, and that's causing huge. So, so you know, there, a place like Alaska, you'd figure it would actually, it might even do better, but it doesn't. It's actually really badly hurt. Um, so it's a complicated problem. There are some surprises, but, but there are those general patterns I mentioned. I think we in Texas could show the Alaskans something because the ground under our houses shift, but it's because of dry drought. Same problem, different causes. And probably linked to climate change, too. Yeah. What are some of the most effective things that we can do to turn the tide on the economic cost of climate change? And what do you think could be the monetary impact of some of these things we can do to help? 
So, I, I mean, there are things that you can do to mitigate the, uh, the damages, even for a given amount of climate change. So you can think about sort of ways society can adapt to, to warmer temperatures, you know, get more air conditioning, build seawalls, stuff like that. Uh, but it's generally going to be a lot more cost effective to try and cons- you know, limit the problem, mitigate the sort of reduce the, the, uh, the amount of climate change. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about sort of what they can do at the individual level. You know, can I buy a hybrid car? Can I fly less? Maybe I'll become a vegetarian. I even have friends who are talking about having fewer kids because they want to have less effect on climate change, which mm-hmm. seems like a huge sacrifice to me. But, but people think about it. And, and those things are fine, but there's not much you can do at the individual level with stuff like that. This is really something that needs national or even global level policy. And it's, so it's much more effective to be pushing for those kinds of policy changes. Um, vote for candidates who will, who will do something about climate change. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so I've already mentioned a carbon tax. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, cap and trade could also work. Um, policy to encourage uh, technological development. There are, there are a variety of policies uh, or policy combinations that, that could be really effective. But, but at an individual level, sort of the most effective thing you can do is, is, is push for the politicians who will support those things. Last thing, and we like to say on this show, too, is to talk about it. And a lot of other people come on and say, talk about it. Because I sense that people really need to have a more fluent understanding of cap and trade and carbon taxes. So then when they hear it being thrown around for other people's reasons, that they don't take it and accept it as a dirty word. Are there any innovations or changes or other things or occurrences out there on the horizon related to climate change that are expected to have a significant economic impact? So let me talk sort of two broad areas here. One is sort of policy developments that a lot of other countries around the world are starting to take action. Um, The European Union has put in a carbon price on a big chunk of their economy. China, which is now the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitter, it passed the U.S. a few years ago, it's fast growing, just put in a carbon price on a big chunk of their economy. Um, This is a global problem. It it needs a global solution. And no one country by itself can solve it. Um, But other countries are starting to move, which is really encouraging. Um, Though if the U.S. could be a leader, that would probably get other countries to move a lot faster. You said they put in a carbon tax on a big chunk of their economy. What does yeah. that mean? It's major emitting industries. Okay. Um, so electric power, metals, stuff like that. Um, the uh, It's not covering every source of emissions the way you'd really like, but it's a start. And I imagine that's how most countries are going to do, start with one sector, or as you say, one chunk, and then move on. We've been with Professor Rob Williams from the University of Maryland with his expertise in environmental economics. Thank you. We really appreciate it. We're going to turn now to our next guest, another expert, and we're so happy to have him with us, and that is Jesse Keenan, Ph.D. Jesse is an associate professor and social scientist with the faculty of the School of Architecture at Tulane University in New Orleans. His research focuses on the intersection of climate change, adaptation, and the built environment. Jesse has previously advised on matters concerning the built environment for agencies of the U.S. government, for governors, mayors, and Fortune 500 companies as well. Jesse also formerly served as the area head for real estate and built environment on the faculty of the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He is author of the New York City 2040 Housing, the Next One Million New Yorkers, and Climate Adaptation, Finance, and Investment in California, as well as many, many other publications. Jesse holds a law degree, as well as a Master's of Science in Real Estate and the Built Environment. Thank you so much for being with us, Jesse. We really appreciate it. Oh, listen, thank you so much for having me. And it's great to hear your prior guests and maybe build upon that conversation because it's a great one. Exactly. Jesse, from your work perspective, how do climate change and the economy connect or intersect? And again, why should that matter to our listeners from your perspective? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think building upon uh, your, what your guest has gotten to there, um, I think is really critical. And maybe thinking about it at a perhaps more applied sense, uh, perhaps even thinking about it at the household level. And I think what we're seeing now 
um, is a broader realm of uh, two ways to think about climate risk. And we can think about it in terms of physical risk and the extent to which climate impacts or climate attributed impacts, not all impacts are um, attributable to climate change, of course, given natural variability and other phenomenon. But those impacts um, shape everything from the price of food that we eat and the, the, how much money we have at the end of the month to buy groceries and make trade-offs between things like groceries and medicine, uh, um, or how much uh, uh, we can afford for our electricity bill to even have air conditioning. But it also shapes a number of things in terms of production and consumption, and particularly in my area, uh, the consumption of housing, uh, real estate uh, in particular. Um, so that's a physical risk, and that shapes you know, infrastructure, it shapes goods and services, it shapes a whole variety of things. But we also have transition risks, and transition risks can come from a couple of different avenues, including policy itself. And as we move our global economies um, towards a net zero transition, um, there's winners and losers along the way. And, you know, as your prior guest, uh, Dr. Williams, was uh, highlighting, you know, other countries, for instance, around the world are moving towards a carbon tax. And let me say, the carbon dividend plan is by far the most effective and most positive bilateral, broad scale coalition that we have, I think, to address climate change policy as a country and the work that he's done. Um, with the Climate Leadership Council. That's it. This is the path forward. It's pretty clear and I think universally recognized. I would love to hear the term more often carbon dividend as opposed to carbon tax. We'll probably do a show that talks more about that because I really think that needs to get out in the atmosphere. Dividend, and, not tax. And how we spend that dividend, thinking about matters of social equity uh, and a wide variety of issues related, allied issues associated with environmental justice, it's all there. But let me go back to transition risk for a second. Because think about this. Different countries around the world, they're moving. They're making investments. They're making capital investments in new research and development, new modes of production and consumption that are in this net zero. And we have a transition risk right here at home that if we don't catch up, we don't make those investments, we lose out in terms of labor market participation and in intellectual property in this broader advancement. So there's physical risk, and then there's transition risk. And that can come in a lot of forms as we sort of parse the winners and losers of transitioning to this new net zero economy. Thank you so much. And I agree there's a fear with me and my other green friends that we are falling behind in this transition and we're all wondering, can we catch up? So thank you for bringing that up. I want to talk though about the fact that it impresses me so much, as I've mentioned to you before, and that is that you are among some of the first scholars to study the relationship between climate change and real estate, including the first to publish peer-reviewed evidence of the existence of a climate change signal in a real estate market and in a mortgage market. And that was my other life was real estate development. So it very much interests me. Thank you so much, Jesse. We really appreciate your help. We will be right back to really unpack this more after the break. Welcome back to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio. We are back with Dr. Jesse Keenan, and he's talking to us about climate change and the economy. And more specifically, we want to really delve into it with Jesse about the intersection of climate change and real estate, as well as its impact on the mortgage market. As I said, this is fascinating. So can you tell us more about that, Jesse? Yeah, and you know, I think the relationship between housing and the built environment and climate change is certainly one that's an emerging field of study. Um, but in that, there's a wide variety of relationships here. And I think um, just to pivot to health for a second before we jump into the economics, and indeed they're cer certainly closely related, um, you know, as for instance, we see more exposure with a warming climate, greater moisture in the atmosphere, um, you know, many of our houses and uh, the places that we live and work. Um, will have, for instance, greater challenges with mold. Uh, and that mold is going to drive uh, asthma and other pulmonary uh, aspects of, uh, that define our public and collective human health. And so, you know, none, you know, never mind the flooding and the, you know, risk of casualty and loss in those other terms, but there's all these chronic stresses. So 
you know, it happened, that relationship is quite broad. But let's pivot over a little bit to the economics, because this is what we care about as renters and as homeowners uh, at the end of the day. So, you know, one of the things that uh, is a relationship that we see is that consumers are beginning, that is, um, particularly from uh, for sale real estate and housing, uh, buyers and sellers are beginning to discount the certain types of risk. Uh, in the buying and selling of real estate, whether that's a risk associated with forest fires or that's a risk associated with uh, extreme precipitation risk, flooding, sea level rise, and the like. We're starting to get these signals. And it's really quite interesting because some of it is a reflection of increased costs, like increased insurance costs, um, increased um, just nuisance of it used to take 10 minutes to go to the grocery store. Now, because the surface flooding, it takes an hour, right? So it's just a nuisance for to live in this particular neighborhood. Um, but it's also a reflection of forward-looking behavior to the extent that people are perceiving a forward decline in collateral value or a forward decline of the value of that house in particular, because it may be underwater, right? It may go down with a forest fire, whatever that may be. And this is something that we see in discounting and, and reducing the value of housing. And we also see this resonating in the mortgage markets to the extent that different types of mortgage market participants are beginning to understand the, um, a wide variety of risks um, including collateral risk and the risk of devaluation, but also things like prepayment risk. So if you own a mortgage and you're an investor in a mortgage, when someone pays it off early, let's say via insurance proceeds from a casualty loss, that's not as much interest. That's not as much yield on the investment. So there's a huge realm here of activity that's happening um, by between consumers and changing consumer preferences and a greater reflection, including forward-looking reflection of risk, but it's also showing up in, in mortgage markets and capital markets increasingly as well. Now, Jesse, having been in real estate development, as I said, in my other life, I know, too, that regulatory issues can drive up the cost of developing. And, of course, that's passed on to buyers as well as mortgage companies. So how does that impact? How does the regulatory environment as it relates to climate change, impact the built environment. For example, I have to think that maybe there's more inspections that have to be done and maybe more sturdy types of buildings. I was a developer in South Florida, and you know that the South Florida Building Code is one of those ones that is held up as exemplary in terms of being sturdy. So how does that impact? You know, because I hear you saying on one hand, values are being devalued because of the forward risk or the forward perception of risk. So where does this regulatory environment come in? Well, let me also just say that it's uh, in certain areas that are comparatively lower risk, we see pr uh, values going up, right? Oh. So it's a double-edged sword, right? Values are going down in some areas that are high risk, and in other areas, particularly proximate localized areas, you see values uh, going up. And we see this uh, in wide heterogeneity in terms of geography and jurisdictions in the United States, all across the country, coast to coast. Um, but let me say this. So it's not so much production costs, in, increased in production costs associated with building code compliance or upping the material standards uh, with buildings. And, and those are certainly costs, but those are largely marginal costs. What it really reflects and the real challenge ahead of us, and this relates to regulatory costs that you cite in terms of zoning and land use regulation, um, is scarcity of land. And I think where we're at now is that we recognize that some areas, whether it's a function of urban service delivery, infrastructural capacity, or just the defensibility or feasibility in terms of engineering um, adaptations and mitigation, uh, risk mitigation uh, to climate change impacts, it, it, these places simply aren't going to uh, be able to house housing, right? Um, and that we are going to have, in many, uh, particularly urban areas, this will be a challenge, um, just less developable land, right? And there becomes a land scarcity, and that indirectly uh, challenges affordability of housing. Um, and that's a major problem, because you can't look at this just in a kind of unidimensional notion of risk, right, that we're just looking at housing, um, that, uh, that um, we have to look at it in terms of public health, you have to look at it in terms of affordability, community resilience. There's a wide variety of lenses here that reflect a wide variety of parallel stresses um, that are happening. But at the end of the day, this is also not just about risk, but also about opportunity, because we can now think about infill development, that's developing in higher densities. 
um, in uh, more urbanized areas that have the benefit of accessibility, a low, lower carbon footprint. Uh, and I mean accessibility in terms of transportation, education, healthcare, et cetera. So we have the tools for sustainable urban development. Um, and in that regard, there's an opportunity. It is, but even that opportunity has some stressors because infield urban development is already under stress from skyrocketing prices as well as driving out the folks who used to live there from gentrification. So I think if somebody mentioned too, it really does need to be addressed at the policy level. Well, no doubt, and I have been the uh, proprietor uh, um, for many years of the broader public conversation about climate gentrification and the extent to which climate gentrification has the you know, potentially maladaptive component of, of, of further marginalization. Um, but then again, we also have the tools like inclusive zoning, right, um, where right. we have the capacity to impose certain uh, levels of affordable housing or mixed income housing on new development. There are mechanisms. We have the tools in the toolbox, right? What we fundamentally need is political leadership in an alignment between private sector and public sector activities. And I think whether we see that with credit rating and the bond markets or uh, capital markets imposing this on the private sector, I think we see a convergence of both public and private interest in this realm. Indeed. Before we have to go, let's talk a little bit, though, about the financial markets. Can you talk to us about how climate change and the financial markets have intersect, and how do those impacts break down to impact the everyday lives of individuals? Sure. So we're in the middle of what I would call a climate intelligence arms race. Uh, massive uh, amounts of energy and, and technology and research going into thinking about um, how do we measure these impacts? Uh, and then conver uh, uh, conversely, how do we disclose that? How do we create greater transparency, not only for private decision-making, but transparency in terms of, let's say, private equity? You invest in a company, you buy a piece of stock, uh, a component of stock or a share of stock, you want to know and you want to have, you would assume otherwise that there is a material impact to climate that should be disclosed, and therefore you can make uh, investment decisions accordingly. So I think you know, there's the disclosure realm, there's the uh, associated financial services that support that disclosure. There's another uh, angle to this that we actually have agency or a capacity, I think, increasingly to make elections in our own investments uh, that go towards funds uh, with sustainable uh, and impact-driven criteria. Uh, and there's some limitations there. Uh, this uh, past fall, I was editor uh, with a number of people at the U.S. Uh, Commodities Future Trading Commission of the first major climate change report uh, uh, out of a U.S. financial regulator. And we have, uh, it's entitled Managing Climate Risk in the U.S. Financial System. And we have a wide variety, uh, let's say a broad discussion here, but also some concrete measures that we as individuals, but also as the economy, uh, can think about in terms of advancing both a just, equitable uh, measures of adaptation and climate mitigation going forward. I have read there's a lot of work going on in that area. Last thing, Jesse, before we go, you speak of hope in your work, and you have a framework for a solution moving forward. Can you tell us really briefly about that and how everyday folks can make an impact on climate change and the economy? Yeah, so I just want to reiterate what your prior guest said, which is, you know, at the end of the day, this is about uh, democratic processes, and we have to elect, particularly in the world of adaptation, about what we want to protect and what we want to let go. Right? Where do we prioritize things in our own world and in our own communities? And this is really going to happen through democracy and engagement with politicians and holding them accountable when it comes to even local investments about a school board um, building a facility or building a piece of infrastructure. I mean, we have to hold people accountable um, at, at all levels of governance and in government. Um, but again, at the end of the day, I think we have a capacity not only through democratic processes, but market-based economy in terms of our participation about thinking about where we live, thinking about how we work and how we consume. Those things add up and they're important. Thank you so much, Jesse. We really appreciate your help with this. You have made us smarter. We've been with Dr. Jesse Keenan, Associate Professor at the Tulane University in New Orleans. We thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. We want to give a shout out now to our sponsors. That is EarthX, the world's largest environmental experience, promoting environmental awareness through expo, conferences, film festival, interactive experiences, and now EarthX streaming TV service. 
Our other sponsor is North Haven Gardens. Since 1951, North Texas's premier nursery, garden shop, and horticulturist. Thank you. Our other sponsor is Natural Awakenings, Dallas-Fort Worth Magazine, the Green, Healthy, and Sustainable Living Authority for the DFW Metroplex and North Texas communities. Print issues of Natural Awakenings can be found in all Whole Foods markets, natural grocers, central markets, and sunflower shops, and many, many other locations, as well as available free for download online at nadallas.com. Thank you, sponsors. Welcome back to Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio. To today's show on global warming and climate change, the economics of climate change. And our guest now for this segment is Jasmine Sanders. Jasmine is Executive Director of Our Climate which is an advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C., and they empower young people to educate the public as well as elected officials about science-based, equitable climate policy solutions that build a livable world. Now, prior to coming to our climate, Jasmine managed the strategic initiatives and special projects for an international refugee rights protection agency operating in over 16 different countries. She also interned with the U.S. House of Representatives for their Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and she did a policy fellowship with Terpstra Associates, where she advocated on Capitol Hill for agriculture and environmental issues. Jasmine holds a graduate degree from the University of Essex, specializing in climate change. Welcome, Jasmine. We're so glad you could be with us today. Hi, Bernice. Thank you so much for having me. Truly excited about being here. Jasmine, over the last year of our broadcast, the term climate refugees has come up a lot. And I've looked at your writings on climate migration, which, of course, in many cases, it's what creates these climate refugees. So will you tell our listeners what you mean exactly by climate migration? What causes it? Who is affected by it? And why are those who are affected so affected? Yeah. So, you know, climate migration occurs when stressors such as changing rainfall, heavy flooding, wildfires, and sea level rise put pressure on people to leave their homes and their livelihoods behind. It makes their homes uninhabitable, and it looks different around the world. But one thing we do know is that it can no longer be ignored. An interesting um, fact that I believe many people don't know is that 80% of people displaced by climate change are women. So while climate change threatens livelihoods and security around the world, it's women who are bearing the brunt. The other thing to be noted about climate migration is that in most circumstances, not all, but most, climate change is not the sole factor in prompting global climate migration. On a global level, you can usually count on the fact that there were other pre-existing stressors, such as war, a country's economic decline, and or slow onset climatic effects, such as drought in a community, state, country, region, et cetera, and the climate disaster was only the tipping point. Um, When we talk about climate refugees, there is um, some tension in either calling them climate refugees or climate migrants. Now, why is that? That's because under the 1951 convention, persons affected by climate change are not referred to as refugees because the status of refugees describes an individual who's outside of their country of nationality, who is unable or unwilling to return due to a well-rounded fear of persecution based on five grounds, which are race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, and or political opinion. However, there was this landmark UN human rights ruling in January of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is where an individual um, who was from Kiribati um, had fleed and, you know, they really wanted a protection status. Unfortunately, the ruling was not good for the Tia Tota family on an individual basis. However, the UN did put governments and countries on notice that they do have an obligation to taking care of families and individuals who are fleeing from natural disasters. This also brings up the point that we need global protection for climate refugees. It's a global human issue that transcends politics. 
majority of all individuals and families who are affected by a climate disaster will first temporarily relocate, and then they're going to make the permanent move. So when you're relocating from a climate disaster, you're bringing along the sadness, the lost hopes, the dreams, and the visual memories of fleeing. Quite frankly, it can be just too painful to return, um, especially if there's nothing to return to. And when we want to put this in perspective, 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. So climate refugees can live anywhere in the world, ranging from the Pacific Island states such as Kiribati and Tuvalu that are dealing with sea level rise, to farmers in countries in West Africa who can't cultivate their crops or raise livestock anymore because of drought and flooding, to a multi-generational family who's resided in New Orleans for decades and their home has now been damaged by a Category 5 hurricane and unsurvivable storm surges. When we yeah, talk we about the intersecting effects of climate change, it's communities of color who are disproportionately impacted. And we know a lot about the migration here in Dallas. I was still in South Florida and Miami when Katrina happened, but my relatives were here. And even now, almost, what, 10, 15 years later, Dallas still can talk about their statistics of the migration as a result of Hurricane Katrina. But let me ask you this, Jasmine. I have to think that there's some impact or some intersection with climate migration in the worldwide global immigration issues and immigration experiences that the globe is having. Can you talk about that a little bit? Of course. You know, migration in general, immigration in general, has become so politicized. Um, and now you put climate change on top of that, which is another hot topic. Um, and the world, unfortunately, is just not a friendly place right now for new people showing up where you are. Um, that's in the United States. That's in Europe. Yeah. And, you, you know, unfortunately, that's how it is right now. Um, so this is why it's very important for us to establish various global policies and protections for people who are affected by climate migration. Um, and, and this is having to be talked about on, on the UN side, because again, you know, migrants affected by climate change are not officially protected under refugee status. Um, and, you know, we are going to constantly be affected and impacted by climate change at increasing levels. And so we have to think about how are we going to accommodate people having to move from their homes, even on a proactive account, noting that your city um, or, or your state, for example, Louisiana, where I'm from, it's washing away. And so you have to understand at some point that people are going to have to proactively move away from there. Where are they going to go? And an influx of a population into a, a city or state or region is then going to cause stressors on a community level, on an economic level. And so you have to take all of that into account. How is everybody or the total society, not just the folks who have to move around, being affected by climate migration? Some of it we've talked about, but I think it's just very important for people to understand so that those who are not affected or who perhaps think they're not or think they're never going to be affected, that they understand that it does and can impact them as well. Right. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, this goes back to the influx of a new population into where you are. Um, we very much need to be aware of what are the existing stressors in wherever we live. Um, and then when you get an influx of a population who does not belong there, what is the welcome like? Are you embracing them as part of the community? Are you making sure that there are jobs available? Um, how are they impacted just on an everyday basis? You know, we have the intersecting effects um, of climate change. And often when we talk about those, 
we only talk about the environmental and the economical standpoint. We don't really get into the racial, the migration, the food insecurity, the housing, the sociocultural. And so all of these effects disproportionately impact communities of color and disproportionately impact women. And so we then have to, when we're embracing new people into our communities, and if we want to actually be proactive about this, then we need to be having the conversation, um, not just as policy and decision makers, but on the community level as well. Last thing, and then we really must go, even though I hate to go, does climate migration have any intersection with our current COVID crisis? Can you tell us Very much so. briefly about that so our listeners understand it and get it? Yes. Climate migration, uh, climate change, and COVID-19 are completely um, related and intersected. Um, this is because, again, going back to those disproportionate impacts on communities of color, and, we're, and we really get down to, with the infrastructure, not just here in the United States, but the, around the world of racial inequity, and then the result of that is the lack of accessibility for a number of things, such as food insecurity, health, housing, and individual rights. Um, and, you know, a, a bunch of people have been talking about how the COVID-19 crisis, how we've gone about um, solution finding and, and different laws put in place, that is definitely um, some of the procedures that we should take with addressing the climate crisis that we are currently in. Thank you so much. We've been with Jasmine Sanders of Our Climate. We really appreciate your help in helping us to understand more about climate migration and how it affects the economics of climate change. Thank you so much. And thank you, listeners, for being with us today and listening into Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio. The conversation starts here, but our goal is for it to continue in your home, in your social circles, your workplaces, and at the water cooler, as well as in the grocery checkout line, so that we can all work together to realize that healthy living is simply not possible without a healthy planet. Our culture is the result of a trillion tiny acts taken by billions of people every day, like yourself. And each of those tiny acts can seem insignificant, but all of them add up, one way or the other, to the change we each live through. This is Bernice Butler. Thank you again, and join us again next week for more Healthy Living, Healthy Planet Radio.